I was thinking, Max, you have heard the um, ideas around research within the academia, within the pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, for the future. Do you think that your global map of what it looks like has the, the answers now within the trends and innovations, or what would you like to see more of? <laughs> Okay, well, that's a difficult one, isn't it? it really, I mean, I think it's, it's a sort of dilemma we face with um, cancer research, isn't it? That, uh, of course, uh, I think he's right, all this sort of huge, huge change in the uh, methods of treatment, what we used to call chemotherapy, but now moved on to targeted treatment. I mean, this is, the, of course, this is really going to be the future of cancer treatment, it's true. And it's uh, so important that that develops. The problem is that um, we already saw within Sweden there's a, an issue of equity, isn't there, in outcomes. That's, uh, that's a sort of grossly, grossly magnified on a world scale, isn't it? It's really, it's really difficult to know how can, we, how can we sort of reduce some of these enormous disparities in, in access to healthcare around the world. And I think we should think about it. It's, it's all very well to, on a personal basis. Oh, I want the best available and best treatment and disease-free survival if I can get it. But it is, uh, it, in a way, with, I think it should address the issue that it, it is grossly unfair that a large proportion of the population in the world don't have access to even the most simple basic treatments. Now, what to do about that is another issue. How can we address that? And the question to the Swedish cancer side, I think it was a valid one. What, what do you do for research outside outside the country, and it's difficult for cancer societies, I can see that, their donors, are, their donors are people in Sweden who've lost a relative and they want to benefit people with cancer. Nevertheless, I think it, it would behove cancer societies to think a little bit more widely in the end, and, and, and have hats off to, for example, the American Cancer Society, which does fund research outside the United States by non-US researchers, rather quietly, I have to say, because it, again, it's a cancer society that is facing its donors, and if they knew that, what are you giving all this money for doing this in, in some obscure place in Africa? But nevertheless, they do, and I think cancer society should think a little bit about this issue of equity, within, equity within Sweden is one thing, but equity around the world is another. But specifically, what would you like to see? Could you give oh, one example? Isn't it, I mean, isn't it difficult? How could it, I don't know. I think it's a very good thing to debate, actually. My, my own ideas, I, I gave one example, okay. I mean, in low-income countries, you saw the example from Susan, the, the huge difference you have in outcome from just a stage at presentation, just such a simple thing, isn't it? And people say, oh, people in developing countries come very late. They do, but why is that? Is it always total ignorance? Did they never show up? What happens? Is it a matter of education? How can we, how can we do something about it? That seems to me one of the really basic things, isn't it? Mm. And actually, people are very pessimistic about the outcome of treatment in low-income countries. It's not as bad as you think. If you, if you are actually treated from cancer, it's not so desperate. Even breast cancer, your chances of survival, on average, in a low-income country can be 50, 60 percent. That's pretty good, really, if you think about it. So we really should be able to do better than that, I think, even with relatively simple technology. Klaus, what could you do better? Uh, well, I have two comments. One is on... Uh, cancer research in Sweden and other European countries, US, and the other one is on the inequity. So I can start with the first in mm. this uh, first round. So uh, you mentioned the 2.7% that was relevant to uh, uh, poor and middle income countries, but you also said that, that it's, it depends on how you calculate that, because uh, it's probably what could be of immediate use, because I think that the figure is much, much higher in the long term, because although there are differences, as you pointed out, in the uh, incidence and mortality, it looks pretty much the same all over the world, I, I would say. It's the same type of cancers that are common in different parts of the world. So I, I would say that most of the research that is done in uh, Sweden and other uh, rich countries will be relevant also to uh, uh, other countries. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, there are two different situations. One is where you have to spend a lot of money for sophisticated research, because you need to test for a lot of genes, for a lot of immunological functions to explore your therapy. That is extremely expensive, and it can only be done, perhaps, in a rich country. But once you have your answers, you can develop with new technology very 
robust tests that can be applied all over the world, and, and treatments also, so that I think uh, in the long run the, the figure should be 27 or perhaps even much, much higher. Uh, uh, and take immunotherapy as an example. I'm an immunologist myself, and I, uh, during many years I felt really awkward when I read research applications. People who wanted to do immunotherapy by taking out cells from the blood, cultivating in a GMP laboratory at enormous costs, giving them back to patients where they would cause side effects so that you would have to have them in, in intensive care. That could only be done in one hospital in Sweden, <laughs> essentially, and would never be applied in a poor country. But as development has shown us, the, the very simple answer was not to do those complicated things. It was to develop drugs that inhibit uh, the negative control of the immune system. And those drugs can be given in any oncology clinic and in, and in most countries, although you have to learn how to deal with the rather new spectrum of side effects. So I think that will eventually roll out. I think it could be applied already today. You can give these treatments to, uh, to outpatients. But it's a matter of pricing, of course. Everything so is a matter of price. pricing. Yeah. Right, Susan. You, you also had a, a very optimistic presentation. Uh, you talked about many possibilities. Blood testing, immunotherapies that uh, we heard about now. Um, precision medicine, for example. But when will this be applicable to any cancer patient, not only the rich, do you think? Is there a plan? So, I mean, I think, again, the first thing you have to understand is by understanding the true complexity of cancer, um, yeah, I always say, you know, it is a complex disease, but you have to embrace the complexity. Once you understand it and you understand the things that you can target, then you can reduce to practice. I think the good news is the cost of sequencing has gone down dramatically. It's dropping faster than Moore's Law, so faster than the cost of, you know, our improvement in um, computing power. Um, the cost of sequencing is coming down, so um, it is now possible to do uh, whole genome sequencing um, for you know, routinely and um, serially on patients. But the cost of these individual tests for individual cancers that we know can be applicable is also dropping um, dramatically. And the other thing that is happening is the development of point of care technology and the use of kits. So. Whilst when things are first introduced, they are relatively expensive, as Klaus has said, the ability to reduce that to practice and reduce the cost down should make it accessible for a larger proportion of, um, of patients around the world and a larger proportion of countries to be able to afford. But when? Well, I mean, it's happening um, already. I mean, you see the advent of the technologies that have already been there are spreading um, a, a, a around the world. I mean, we would always like it to be faster than it currently is and, and immediate. Um, you know, again, you come back to that you have to fund the innovation in some ways. There has to be some return on the, on the innovation in order to fund the next round. And we spend, for example, at AstraZeneca about $2.6 billion on cancer research um, each, each year. It's a huge investment. There has to be some return on that in order to fund the next round of, 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 of research. But there is the potential to spread that more generally and um, you know, also to think about the ways in which we can do it so it ultimately becomes more cost effective. I, I think the technology advances can enable us to do that and I think they will make a huge difference over the next 10 years. Mm. Yes, Klaus. Yeah, I agree very much with that, but I, if you want to look for the most immediate thing to do globally, I very much agree with Max that we, we already have the knowledge to dramatically change the, the picture in many of the low-income countries because that's all about early detection, screening, early diagnosis. Um, and um, we don't need so much more research about the methods as such. We know them already. It's a question of uh, political implementation. And uh, maybe it's also a little bit about research on, on uh, whether they will be followed. So if I can follow up with the Swedish examples, you saw that the mortality, the decrease in mortality was seen only for the women with higher education and uh, not for the others. And it's the similar picture with men. And uh, the reason for that, uh, we have analyzed it in a report, so I won't go through it in detail, but uh, basically the, if you look at the overall cancer incidence, it's the same in the income groups. The problem is that uh, the people in the low income groups get 
more difficult cancers such as lung, can lung cancer uh, that are lifestyle related, that are more difficult to treat and that are very difficult to detect early and they also come to diagnosis much later because they are poorly informed. So some of these things are things that you can affect at the individual level, but you can also ask whether perhaps the healthcare system has a greater responsibility to try to really get these people to come to the screening tests. Mm -hmm. And I think that signals to us that it's, if you're going to implement a new diagnostic or screening procedure in a poor country, you cannot just pour money and hope that it's going to work, because there's going to be a lot of uh, obstacles around that. There are traditional uh, things that will prevent women or men from coming to this and, and uh, that there will be delays for uh, many different reasons and that perhaps we should make more research on so that we can tackle how you really implement the screening program in an efficient way. So Max, do you agree we know what to do? <laughs> it's just to do it in a good way or convince people to do it? Yeah, I mean we can't say research we can only do what we can do and a lot we of the issues are way beyond Research, aren't they? I mean, the huge disparities in income and so on. I mean, that's, that's basically at the, at the root of the problem. Uh, but as cancer researchers, we can, only, we, we can only do what's in our hand to do. We can try to influence decision makers and change the world economic order. <laughs> you know, our chances of success as individuals are small. So we can only do what we can do in research. And I think, I think so we to yeah, manage what, do the best we can do with what resources are there and try to nag for a little bit more. Mm. Susan, just nag for a little bit more. If you, if you want to be optimistic and see the possibilities, you, you, what do you think? Uh, are the possibilities huger than the challenges? So again, or I the other way around? I think it's we hard to, to know after your three presentations. I think we have to focus on the things that we've already learned over the years that we've been developing cancer treatments. As I would agree with what um, Max and Klaus have said, we, we already know some of the things that we can do. Um, treating people early and rapidly once they are diagnosed, uh, identifying more patients earlier, those will make the biggest differences in implementing effectively the drugs that we already have. Um, there are many drugs which are coming off patent. Um, there's biosimilars that are, that are coming in that will reduce some of the costs that will be able to spread out the, the benefits of the science that's already happened. And we need to continue to work on the technology and reduce the costs and, and the time frame for the development of the next wave um, of, of technology improvements. But I, I do think that you know, we've made significant progress in the last 10 to 20 years. I think if we meet again in 10 or 20 years, um, here, I think we'll see significant progress and hopefully um, uh, democratization of the access to um, uh, effective treatments. For broader I absolutely hope you're right. Thank you very much, all three of you.